that's been still joining us. Thank you very much for joining me today uh, for a parallel session number 10, Efficacy of Green Alliances, which means corporate and NGO partnerships in reducing plastic waste. I am your moderator of the day. My name is Maggie Lee. I am managing um, the um, Sea Circular program, which is the host of the Sea of Solutions event for this year and also last year. Today is the last day of the event and we've heard from many, many speakers um, their opinion on how to actually eradicate um, plastic pollution. Um, and of course, plastic pollution does not come from one specific place, nor does it have one specific solution. Green Alliances is actually one of the few things that are actually growing in terms of solutions. We know that there are um, quite a lot of debate on whether or not recycling still works, and also whether or not um, policy should be in place uh, for plastics. Some may even go to say that plastics should be banned in total, but um, are any of these actually the real solution to, um, to plastic pollution? Today, I'd like to turn our attention to green alliances, which means corporate and non-governmental organization partnerships. Um, even though the UN is not an NGO, but we are also uh, part of um, this community with other civil society members. And therefore, we are also interested in, um, in engaging in green alliances. Today, we have speakers from all over um, the world, really, um, today with us and from uh, many different time zones. And I'll introduce to you one by one after um, this um, introduction. So in short, um, the plastic pollution is basically uh, originating from something we call the linear model. Uh, we use raw material, we take taking from the planet Earth, and then we use it and we dispose of it. Um, what Sea Circular is trying to do is to create circularity and therefore the name Sea Circular, which is a double entendre on the area we work on, which is Southeast Asia. We are trying to make sure that what we use is put back into the systems so that it creates something called circular economy. And know that um, how can C circular add value to any of the businesses commitments is that we try to share advocacy on using on having less plastic wasted and also to make sure that more stakeholders are in tune with this and also are um, in agreement with your commitments. We do want to work with governments, um, especially those in Southeast Asia. Uh, with academia research and of course the private sector which is actually the the people who are manufacturing all the plastics that are coming into the market we as consumers are buying these from them and so technically we're all involved in this entire value chain so how can sea circular help is that um, we're trying to actually aggregate many of these green alliances, some of whom are represented today at this panel. Um, as you can see on the right side of the screen is that we're trying to make sure that the commitments and collaborations are done in cohesion amongst the sectors. So there could be um, governmental representatives and also industry members and also academia and of course NGOs or intergovernmental organizations such as the UNEP itself. So um, there was a study in 2018 that looked into green alliances and its effectiveness. We know that green alliances stand for many things and they come at different levels. Some green alliances may be much more geared towards corporate, corporate uh, collaboration. Some may be more from the NGO side. They do want some sort of an initiative going on and they advocate for a certain cause and ask for the private sector participation. So this study, we actually found out that um, what um, professionals and people who are actually consumers and the gen, uh, members of the general public find that the top three important um, aspects of green alliances include helping to create external value for ecosystems. This, in, in, in other words, means that they do want to make sure that it's one plus one equals greater than two. If private sector and um, the NGO or civil society come together, there's more than what they could originally do by themselves. Secondly, we want to minimize negative environmental impact. And for the purposes of this event, um, it's for the minimization of marine plastics or plastic pollution. And, and, and the third one, interestingly, is to debunk myths and uncovering greenwashing. For those who are unfamiliar with the term, greenwashing means that um, companies or businesses are saying one thing to make themselves look better using environmental claims that may not be always factual. So this is something that they think that green alliances, um, the people who are surveyed in this, um, in this questionnaire, believe that um, the NGOs could help by uncovering greenwashing. 
These are some of the very interesting topics that we know about greenwashing or sorry, about green alliances already. And we do actually look forward to act, asking all our, um, all our speakers to present on that. So first, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker of the day, uh, Mr. James Scott, who is actually representing TerraCycle Taui Foundation. He is the executive director there. And I'll hand the time over to you, James. Um, what experiences have you had with green alliances in your past and current positions? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, in the past, uh, I definitely had a few experiences bringing groups together. And, and so the reason I guess I'm here today is uh, I see them as a major benefit because one of the challenges I see is that uh, a lot of people want to do the right thing. The organizations want to do the right thing. We meet with a lot of corporates. They, their intentions are, are seemingly good, but they don't really know where to go. And I think that the alliances bring uh, multiple stakeholders together to to help fill in those gaps because I see a lot of CSR programs big on PR but not really big on impact and I think this is where uh, the alliances can really sort of come together to help raise the standards create more collaboration I see a lot of uh, waste where you know you go to an area there's five ten different organizations doing the same thing they're not coordinating together they're not getting economy of scale and I think that creates an environment where a lot of these programs are not long-term sustainable, their impact is, is lessened. So to me, this seems like a very good tool for people to, to start to work together more. I know for us, it's been quite instrumental and in the, the amount of time it took for us to implement in Thailand was um, greatly shortened by you know, the different groups that we joined up with uh, and the ability to work with private sector and government at the same time to achieve our goals. Um, and so what I would hope to see more in the future is, is definitely raising the bar as well, um, the whole greenwashing issue. So creating standards across the industry so that we're all playing by the same rules. Um, you know, we're trying to tackle all the ways we collect, not just the easiest stuff and then claim success. And I'd like to see you know, those standards held to more activities, as well as to help us raise our own. So that's sort of uh, our stance. It's been a very positive experience for us and holding us accountable and, and to help us be transparent and definitely to help us through the learning curve. Not everything was easy to do and that was greatly mitigated by the partnerships that we, we sort of made. So, Wow, thank you, James. Really looking forward to hearing more about um, that process, that journey that got you to where you are right now, and also the partners that you're partnering with. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Stephanie Baitian. Um, so she's actually the head of uh, market transformation of uh, WWF Singapore. We do have a lot in common, Stephanie. And uh, um, so same question again, what experiences have you had with Green Alliances in your past and current positions? Thank you, Maggie. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us here on this panel. Um, yeah, as Maggie mentioned, I'm head of market transformation, so Maggie knows our, uh, our work quite well. So I would like to share two relevant experiences that we had with um, corporate NGO partnerships. So on the one side, we were um, founding SASPO, that's an alliance for sustainable palm oil in 2016. So that was a really regional focused alliance on the demand side of palm oil. And it was an industry-led alliance um, of companies that were keen to learn more about sustainable or that, yeah, about sustainable palm oil. And it helped, first of all, to raise awareness back then about the topic. And um, it also brought a lot of like workshops, knowledge building, capacity building and, and education. And it actually worked pretty well. So uh, certified sustainable palm oil, luckily is quite available now in Singapore for businesses. And it also helped our members to adopt sustainable sourcing practices. So as one example, we created a business guide for sustainable palm oil with really practical recommendations. And for example, we could showcase that the price gap back then of sustainable palm oil versus um, conventional palm oil was only a few cent. So it really helped the companies also to make the business case for, for the topic. That was the, the one experience. And the other one is obviously our PACT initiative. So PACT stands for Plastic Action. And it's a business-led initiative that recognizes the, the integral role that businesses are playing in the topic of plastic pollution and overuse of plastic. So really focusing on the reduction side of plastic. 
And there we do have two different approaches. So on the one side, we have the, the sectoral collaboration that really um, looks into um, an entire industry sector and identifies the so-called low hanging fruit of um, one item or one unnecessary plastic that everybody can come together and commit to reduce. And it creates just an impact at scale on the one side. Um, on the other side for the individual commitments, and I think that's a little bit also where James came in to really um, understand the, like, the individual commitment of the companies and um, help them to set individual objectives, but also time-bound goals. And we help them along the way on those commitments and we provide support for their challenges. And um, yeah, we go really deep into their operations with some um, commitments, we also have um, individual partnerships for very specific problems. So we do work, for example, with Lendlease on a retail research project to really understand um, the, the impact or the, the possibilities of a circular economy solutions in the retail sector. So as I mentioned, going really deep into their operations and help them along the way. We also provide like science-based um, tools and guidance for those companies. And um, I think those NGO partnerships also help the companies to raise internal awareness. So it can be through management, top management meetings. It can be through green talks with the employees. So I think that also can, can help the companies internally, not only with the sustainability department, but really scale it up within the organizations. And um, yeah, maybe just two last thoughts. Um, on the one side, I think companies nowadays are maybe also in too many alliances. So they commit to something and then they don't have really the time and the effort to, to, to bring in the, like the, the whole team. Um, so I think that that might be uh, um, difficult. So we feel a certain workshop or working group fatigue as well. Um, so I think from, from our perspective to make green alliances really effective because as the, for the topic of the, the talk today, um, that it needs some practical solutions need to come out of the partnership. So that's how, how PACT is working. And it's not only the NGOs always emphasizing that more needs to be done. So I think we passed the stage of awareness rising, but really trying to work with the partners and help them with very practical solutions and tools. So that would be my, my take. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Very interesting that you think that um, sometimes companies may actually not have the bandwidth to take care of all the green alliances that they've joined because, as you know, not, uh, not well, except for plastic uh, producers, technically every company actually that has plastics would be involved in other commodity sourcing as well. So if there is a, a green alliances for every commodity that is of conflict uh, or of controversy, then they may have to join so many of them. And that's actually a great question that I would have for our next speaker, um, who is actually uh, Ms. Vasimon uh, Ruinlek, who is the Partnerships Manager at SCG. She now today actually represents the TPPP Plastics, the Public-Private Partnership for Plastics in Thailand. So um, Kun Vasimon is actually um, obviously employed by the private sector and that actually um, gives us another perspective uh, as opposed to the ones that we've heard earlier from James and Stephanie. Please go ahead Kun Vasimon. Hello, uh, you can see my screen? Yes, it's loading. Okay, right. So actually on, on behalf of my company, I actually did join, uh, we are joining the Green Alliance uh, at the global level and also at the national level as Kun Maki uh, introduced. So the one of those national level is uh, the PPP Plastic Thailand. So which is uh, driven by the business team and there are kind of target of reduced leakage and the plastic waste management infrastructure in Thailand. And it's been driven by the six uh, kind of pillars to help on their improving infrastructure with some innovation that we will bring in and also make people aware and educate about the, because everyone have to have the responsibility to help, right? And of course, the, the policy itself, because we do have the arm to connect to the government. And of course, the data about the plastic waste, because this will help us to see the percent of the recycle, if it's improving or not. So, and some funding. And there are also other, other national kind of a green alliance also like from the brand 
brand uh, company like uh, Nestle, PepsiCo, Unilever. So they create alliance to for the plastic circularity Thailand as well. So, so this is just to show you that uh, what we've been doing because th this green alliance is actually a good platform from my experience is like, uh, because the first thing is like, we, we kind of are focusing on the same mission, right? So, so this PPP plastic uh, try to do kind of be a respected plastic national collaboration platform. So at the moment, I think we have about the 40 member from the different part of the value chain. And I think the second one is stronger, the better. So when we join force and we do have the connect to the subcommittee offer the national waste management plan to talk with the government. So this is a very good angle that that's how, how we work. Like we kind of bring the idea and everything from the value chain and then we bring some suggestion to discuss with the government. So we both will see uh, the, the pro and the con and how we should move for fit better for Thailand. So, and, and I think the third one is the most important when, when you join force like this. So you learn from a different angle. So you learn from the angle of the other part of the value chain and a lot of knowledge can be pulled in to chair and to help uh, create a better solution. So this is just uh, just to share with you the, the target of the PPP. So focusing on the infrastructure and the consumer behavior and the awareness, because we see this is a very important part. I think it's everyone probably see the same thing and a lot of our people. And we already create some kind of project like uh, we call the city project in uh, Bangkok, Kong Thai, and also in Rayong to do some kind of integration of uh, some digital platform or sub organization model like hotel, office or department store and hospital. And for the Rayong in the province, so we do believe that community model and the community themselves play a very important part. So this is what uh, we've been doing for the PPP and we, we believe that is very helpful. Okay. And this is our, another one of the collect back of, our, of the infrastructure because one of the key for circular economy is you require to, to have a collect back system. And I think you can see from a different uh, pledge on, from the band owner that they start to, to have their target KPI on collecting back that some of their product or similar kind. So I see joining hand is, is one of our, the good thing that we can work together and try to be open and, and, and work together to have the same, same mission. Because just like Kun Stephanie said also that sometime uh, one company join a different kind of uh, alliance or group. And, and sometimes I hear the brand owner sometimes mention that, oh, can we just make it kind of uh, aggregate in the same platform? So that, that's one part of, of the, the con size that we still need to try to find a way to, to solve it. Yeah. I think that, that's all for me to share, Kun Maggie. Thank you so much, Kun Vastimon, and you're very right. And um, I, I, I agree very much with also the involvement of communities, um, because if it is just the two parties, the NGOs and the uh, and the private sector, um, how do we know our impact and how do we assess um, how we're doing social economically as well? And last but not least, we have another member of the private sector joining us today, um, Ms. Megan Morikawa, who works for um, Iberostar, which is actually a company that uh, I've mentioned to be very, um, very, very scrupulous in terms of environmental sustainability. They're a hospitality group that is uh, based in Europe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, um, Ms. Uh, Megan Morikawa is now the Global Director for Sustainability at Iberostar Group. So over to you, Megan. 
Thanks, Maggie. Um, and I think this is this is actually a really interesting question. And I'm going to answer about green uh, alliances in, in a traditional sense and in a non-traditional sense. Um, but to get to the traditional sense, I want to tell you a little bit about Iberosaurus. So as Maggie mentioned, we are a, a Spanish-based uh, tourism group that's family-owned, fourth-generation led. But we're now in 19 countries of operation with 120 hotels. And, and uh, before the pandemic, 35,000 employees that were all uh, working to keep those house, hotels fun functioning. A couple of years ago, we, uh, we, we started our wave of change movement, which is our commitment to the ocean because of those 120 hotels, 80% of them are coastal. So the ocean is hugely important to the company. And uh, it was through some incredible enlightened leadership from that fourth generation family leadership that said, we wanna really have a big commitment to the ocean. So uh, through our wave of change movement, first it was a little bit of adapting and making sure that uh, our, our actions fit the company. We first started um, by removing all single use plastics from all of the rooms across the entire operations and are now working to do so across our entire operations, not just in the rooms themselves and said, okay, great, this fits, this is the beginning. And so now we've launched what we call our five long-term commitments to 2030. The first to be single use plastics free across our operations by the end of uh, this year uh, to have no waste being sent to landfill across our operations by 2025 to be carbon neutral by 2030 um, by achieving that neutrality through investing in nature and our destinations. Our second goal is around seafood to source 100% of our, our seafood responsibly. Our third goal is around nature so that all ecosystems that surround our properties are in improving ecological health along side profitable tourism. Our fourth goal is about clients so that they choose Iberostar because of wave of change. But this fifth goal is where the uh, green alliances come in, which is that others follow the same sorts of practices, right? And so we do our best to try and be as transparent as possible, uh, publish roadmaps on how it is that we have these time bound goals, but also the steps you need to take annually in order to get there so that you're not just sitting waiting around till 2029 to figure out how to achieve the goal next year. But we really rely on these partnerships to be able to precipitate what it is that we're doing and make it more general at scale. So some of the partnerships that we depend heavily on are, are with the United Nations through things like UNWTO and UNEP's Global Tourism Plastics Initiative alongside the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to find commitments for tourism to say, we want to remove problematic plastic pack packaging and items from our operations. Um, we're also working with groups like the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, which helps to interface between governments and uh, businesses and academia. We're co-chairs of a tourism action coalition uh, for tourism people in nature, which is trying to bring nature-based solutions into the picture. So those are the more traditional ones. But the more untraditional answer to the question is the more I've been thinking about this, in many ways, uh, the office that I run um, is almost like a green alliance within the company. And this might actually speak a little bit to Stephanie's point as well. Um, so we realized that we needed to have these rigorous science bound targets, but didn't have the expertise in house to be able to do so. So I was hired actually from academia. I was doing my PhD in how we could restore coral reefs that were more resilient to climate change and bringing this marine biology perspective into business again, with that enlightened leadership, allowed me to build a team with folks who came from the United Nations, from Fair Trade, from the uh, US National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And so now we have a team of 18 people who work full time in the sustainability office to help provide this guidance to how all of the steps need to be taken. And you know, we even also provide uh, audits, internal audits of, of any of the sustainability practices to make sure that we're really on track. So in many ways, it's almost like we're functioning our own sort of internal green alliance. But of course, we want to be held accountable uh, uh, publicly through both our transparency and roadmaps, but also through the more traditional green alliances that I mentioned in the beginning. So that's a, a little bit about Iberostar and what we're doing with our wave change movement. Wow, that's a lot. And also a um, great point on ab about the shared resources and how um, how there's really a lack of technical expertise. If you actually look at any environmental problem in any uh, of the private sector um, businesses, because you just simply can't have a team of R&D guys who are actually working on every single environmental problem that may be of your concern in a hotel group. It just does not make any sense at all. And, um, and it's very unrealistic to expect. And it 
very good point brought back from how Stephanie mentioned that this could be a, a shared resource and also a tool system where um, green alliances can actually come together and um, borrow the expertise of NGOs. So thank you all for, for all the um, panelists for, for having this great introduction. I do have a second question for all of you and um, it is how are green alliances effective for plastic waste reduction? As you know, CF Solutions is all about plastic pollution. We are trying to eradicate this problem that is most prominently seen in Southeast uh, Asia. And we know that um, there are so many um, plastic um, waste uh, related green alliances out there. Each one of you are in one actually. So I'd love to actually know more about how is it effective and uh, what are your thoughts about making it more effective even? So um, if I can actually see any one of you unmuting, please go ahead. Okay, I can start first. Okay, so uh, in, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, what we, the Green Alliance help is to create a kind of catalytic action. So it's like when, for example, like from SCG company hat of mine. So when we start working on the kind of a between B2B to create some kind of project that will help, for example, like some some uh, plastic road or some kind of a coal collect. So, so it's, will, it's already start from one to two, right? And then it will expand. So this is one thing that the, it will kind of uh, link kind of domino effect on that. And, and with that, when, when society start to aware, when a lot more people start to do it, so it's mean like uh, society will, will make them think. So this will make them think about uh, what is their role? It's like, uh, how, can, how can we help? So if it's become like a trend that's coming, and then uh, once the society awareness has been established, people will stop to think more about what should they do with with the, the resources, like not just plastic, right? Because in the future, we will see more in terms of the effect of the climate change, the water and some other things. So, so people will start to think more. And I think the, the plastic waste reduction will, will, will be better in terms of when people start to aware more because one of the key that we identified is, uh, is the, the consumer themselves. So they need to know what to do and, and to do the right thing. And of course, I think that the hand joining effort that we call kind of chair economy, because the, with all this activity, uh, the business model that will help uh, to support this based on the chair economy concept is like uh, when you're joining hand, so it will create a synergy effect that should be better. Sometimes it might be costly at the beginning, but together you find a way to reduce the cost down and believe. And it's like, uh, it will create a, a more like sense of responsibility in, in everyone. And, and that will help uh, to reduce the, the real plastic waste from the origin. And I think it's a kind of, a, not just economic, but people will think more both economic and sustainability together in the future. And just uh, one extra question for you, Kunva Simon. When uh, when you mentioned that um, you, you I, I remember that um, SCG is part of two um, at least two um, plastic related um, green alliances. So there are so many big names in, in these alliances. Um, were there um, noticeable changes when let's say one uh, major company joins? Did, did you see major um, uh, effect and like domino effect when other companies see that one major company has joined, we all join together and create some sort of a critical mass. Do you see mm -hmm. this happening? Uh, I see some of that because especially when people start to make a pledge, <laughs> you can see it's, it's thinking from a two angle, if it's from the business angle, so competitiveness is one thing that drives people, right? And another angle is like, if you see from the non-business, it's like, oh, so this is a good thing to do and why don't we do it too? So, so this kind of people have a different angle to think, just like what happened in Thailand when, when we're talking about their kind of campaign to collect back some kind of a bottle, the plastic bottle, just to do some kind of PPE uh, like a fabric in order to, to create that. So people want to do that more and more because no matter what they just wanted for CSR from the beginning, but 
but when they kind of go through such journey, like collecting thing is just make people aware, just like some of the campaign when you go and collect garbage from outside, right, and take photo. So you start to think about, okay, oh, why is here? And, and I should do better myself, not to throw anything or anything for, for other people. So, so that's, I think, is kind of creating such effect. Yeah. Wow, that's a very interesting phenomenon. So no matter why you came, why you joined in the first place, it could be because of pressure or competition, but eventually you do see this growth um, of all these uh, members from the private sector. Speaking mm. of the private sector, I do want to actually ask uh, Megan um, the same question. On top of that, um, it's very interesting how you uh, gave us a, a background on Iberostar. Um, I myself have not had the pleasure to stay at one of your, um, your properties, but um, is it wrong to say that it's not the biggest hotel chain, not not any of the biggest hotel chains of the world? It is not uh, not nearly that at that level because so many of them are bigger. But now that Iberostar is seen as a leader in in this aspect, especially you've mentioned GTPI, you've mentioned quite a few things, and you mentioned also uh, the, um, UNWTO. So I'd just like to briefly mention these uh, abbreviations because uh, Global T uh, Tur Pla Tourism Plastics Initiative is an initiative that's run by the United Nations World Tourism Organization alongside with the United Nations Environment Program. So just like to get those acronyms out there so everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, Iberostar, given that the, the scale is not as big as many of the bigger um, hotel chains is leading the way, how do you think that Gives and puts an effect on the other companies, and how do you think that that makes the entire alliance more effective? Great question. Lots of things to unpack here. I, I like I like that there's a good reminder that maybe we're not as big as we think we are. Because sometimes when it's like, oh my god, making these uh, goals global, it can be quite daunting to do this, especially across many geographic landscapes, right? But I think you're solidly very correct that we're considered a small to medium sized hotel, especially when compared to the larger chains. I think what's really interesting about our case example is that because of that size, and because of a little bit of a unique way that Iberostar is set up, we actually have not only um, the management of many of our properties, but the ownership of them too. But that doesn't mean all of them, right? So in the, in the hotels that are run in a more traditional sense, where either it is a franchise, or maybe you have management, but you're not the owners of the facility itself, there's been a nice portfolio of both so that we can say, okay, in those hotels that we own and manage, we know how to work from a top-down perspective. We own the, like it's one centralized purchasing facility. We can make uh, them feel empowered to help us make decisions with that echo across our supply chain, et cetera. But in those that are in a, in a, a more dispersed sort of transition, then we can work through contracts and we can work through uh, like lateral leadership and we can work through some of these other partnerships as well to be able to provide those tools. And I think what we're discovering is that uh, that scale, if anything, is what businesses do really well, right? And in fact, once you get some of these concepts into the brains of CEOs and COOs and resource officers that do this as a daily bread and butter, it actually becomes using and picking backing off of their knowledge of how to scale any practice or service that they might want to provide across any of the, of the hotels themselves and just do that with sustainability. And so I actually think that knowledge and expertise exists out there to know how to scale. When a hotel wants to bring in a new loyalty program or a new rewards program, they know how to do that across all of their facilities. When they have a change in marketing, they know how to do that. Or uniforms, they know how to do that across all their facilities. Why not have the same thing about the way you sort waste? Why not have the same thing about your seafood supply? Why not have the same thing about how you think about the nature that surrounds and gives services to the hotels themselves? That's a little bit of, of a way that we're thinking about that and uh, and want to be able to provide that sort of leadership. I think for us too, a lot of it needs to come from a, a combination of top down and bottom up, bottom up to have the knowledge necessary. This is why we're working on, on, on and again, I'll, I'll say these roadmaps, right? To say like, this is how we're trying to do it, right? Like we're gonna be as transparent as we can about like, this is how big our carbon footprint was. This is how we calculated. This is a tool that we use to be able to do that. So others can see that too. But of course, none of that's going to be listened to unless you have top down asking, hey, I need to be, you know, getting reports on this carbon footprint. How do we do that accordingly? And so I think both thinking about the, those forms of leadership really help to think as, about scale as well. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned two important points there, scaling up. Um, it could be in terms of pledges. Uh, also, you mentioned a sharing of knowledge, not just across your own chain, um, but also with the, with the other um, 
competitors, the direct competitors in your field, but for a non-competitive or pre-competitive approach. So these things, um, for example, where do you source your bamboo straw for your restaurant? They do not actually create some sort of an edge or they're not proprietary in that sense. So we do want to actually make the switch. So can you actually advise us on how you actually took out the plastic straw? Which alternatives did you look at? Those are really important points that uh, may be shared in Green Alliances, much like the uh, GT PI. Speaking of um, alliances and speaking of tools, uh, I have a good person to ask. Uh, and of course, Stephanie knows that I'm going to turn to her. Um, so Stephanie, I know that um, the green alliances that you led were about creating tools. And I see that some of those origin, original creators of the tools are in, the, in, this, uh, in this session with us. So great to have you. Um, the tools that you have, like, how do they actually help these green alliances be more effective? Yeah, thank you so much, Maggie. Um, I think it's a good point about uh, scaling up also because Megan mentioned it. So we, as I mentioned, we work on sectoral collaboration where we target really like a low hanging fruit that could be a no straws pledge, um, but it can be also um, a back charge pledge or the uh, pledge to um, for the food delivery. We signed a pledge last year so that they automatically opt out cutlery from the deliveries. And it seems like a small change, but that saves 1 million pieces of plastics per week in Singapore. So together with our um, PEC champion, we saved um, in, in less than a year, 64 million pieces of plastic. And again, it's just a small change. We are also working with those companies then in really looking into the business model, introducing reusable, because also just to mention here, single use plastic can never be sustainable. So our focus is always on reduction. And if reduction is not possible, because we also recognize that there are situations where maybe bring your own is not possible, um, um, then we introduce or we recommend to use the material with the least environmental impact. And obviously all the companies, and maybe you know, they, they are asking what is, the, what is the best alternative to plastics? And this is a question obviously not simple to answer. There are many different types of materials from glass to aluminum, paper, and seven different types of plastics even more. So that's why we created the, the tool that you're mentioning is our alternative materials tool, which we just launched um, in September. So that really gives businesses a very practical tool to measure the environmental impact of a different set of materials. So coming back to the point of adding real value to the Alliance to provide some guidance or some science-based tools that maybe the corporates don't have the capacity and we as NGOs together with the like, um, bringing like um, different partners together can build up those tools. So it's a free and open source and I can put the link later in the chat so that can people can take a look. So I think that's an um, important aspect and about also when you mentioned the, the um, what is expected from Green Alliances, there was the debunking of misconceptions. So this tool already also helped us to build a lot of knowledge and awareness about every material has a footprint. There is really no best material. Um, like the worst material maybe is styrofoam, but there are a lot of learnings also coming out of this and really to make um, very um, scientific uh, recommendations to the businesses and not simply switching to something away from plastic, but maybe just shifting the environmental impact to another material. So I think that is also helpful. Wow, thank you. That's a, it would be great if you could share that link with us so that each one of us can actually have access to it. I believe it's free for everyone to use. Is that so? Yes, it's open yes. source. We made it open source on purpose so that anyone can take a look and, and um, use it. Is In the moment, it's designed for, uh, because it considers also the, the downstream, so where, how the waste is treated. So it's um, in the moment for Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Um, uh, Philippines and Malaysia, sorry, um, but we are also in the moment seeing how to expand it. Um, the same with the whole PACT program to really expand it into the region. And maybe one aspect that I didn't mention that our focus is also to target medium-sized local companies because as rightfully was said, the big MNCs, they are already in many of the global alliances in Ellen MacArthur, but our idea is also to target those that are not in those big commitments already and have an impact on the ground. 
Wow, great. Well, very well said, Stephanie. Thank you so much. And for giving me this, uh, this segue into asking our next panelist, because you mentioned two points. You mentioned that uh, downstream waste management, that is something that's very concerning. And by, um, by changing um, the design, um, I actually want to quote some, someone who actually said this yesterday. It's the uh, CEO of TerraCycle, um, Mr. Tom Zaki, who said that um, recyclability should be designed into. So um, I'm paraphrasing actually, not word for word. But it's actually very important because I know that downstream uh, waste management is actually much more expensive than actually creating something that is already um, has, has circularity in mind. And your tool actually can help businesses that do not previously have this uh, resource. They don't have an R&D scientist sitting around in their company actually doing this. And so this tool really enables, uh, especially for the smaller and medium-sized companies to come up with a decision on what tool to use for their product. And so this brings me to James because he's actually working very hard on really actually literally cleaning up Thailand. And this is something that I also want to ask you about because you're also partnering up with some of the biggest um, companies in the world. And there is actually a lot to do, regardless of how much we want to reduce plastic from the source. Plastic is still very necessary and it's not going away anytime soon. We know that it's still being used on a, on a daily basis across uh, many places, especially Thailand. You definitely would have a lot of insights on this. How do you think um, what you're doing could be made more effective as a Green Alliance? Let me collect my thoughts for a second. Um, yeah, you did bring up a really good point is, is that, that uh, again, the, the group's working together to help create those standards, right? Um, this is the problem is that every company is operating different standards and is trying to achieve different goals. And, um, you know, and, and for us, when we're collecting the material and trying to recycle it, you know, each product, each brand has slightly different configurations. And this reduces its ability to be recycled, but also reduces the sort of the efficiency of that recycling. So, you know, what we would like to see and what we're trying to encourage the people working with is to, you know, rethink their packaging. You know, you can still have your marketing incentive. You know, you can still produce a product that the customers want. But by using one type of plastic, or as Tom was saying, and he's much more eloquent than I am, um, you know, designing it right into the process with recycling in mind. And, and another thing that he talked about uh, that I think the alliances can help push is moving the trend away from trying to make the packaging as cheap as possible. Instead, you know, move the packaging towards creating as much value in the packaging as possible. So the incentives to clean it, to collect it and recycle it are higher because we see this trend where the packaging is getting cheaper and lighter and smaller. And this creates massive problems with things like sachets. And, you know, consumers think that they're, you know, doing the right thing because they're buying this thing in this plastic bag, like a laundry detergent, for example. But that, you know, basically in, in most environments, basically, creates an item that won't be recycled. So I think, again, these groups um, directing consumers to understand better, but also the manufacturers to educate them uh, and to help them move towards that. So um, using a, a reusable package or, or something at least that when consumers buy it, it is a lot easier for us to recycle because um, the cost of pulling them from the environment and recycling them, it's, it's never gonna be sustainable. It'll always require additional re uh, revenue unless the value of those materials goes up. So I don't know if that answers it, but um, that's the biggest thing we see. We need help in improving the product design and encouraging that. Like, you, you know, you have Coca-Cola switching from the green Sprite bottle to the clear bottle. Now, is that everything they could do? Maybe not, but was it a step in the right direction? For sure. And I think that was brought about by, you know, public pressure um, on various groups, feedback and things like that. So, you know, that makes that particular bottle easier for us to recycle. So. Thank you for, for giving us that piece of insight. I know that many of the participants in this, uh, in this session are actually looking at how to design circularity into products as well. And so those are really good insights coming from the downstream end because 
of course, we know that we don't want waste management to be further burdened by this, especially in this part of the world where infrastructure is definitely lacking. That's really a, a consistent message from across all sectors in all um, sessions before this one. And so we know that um, TerraCycle uh, Thai Foundation has been doing quite a lot of work with companies too. So how does that come in? I thought you guys are just uh, recycling stuff, right? Is that not right? Um, we are recycling, but the next phase is, is to go into um, product design with local companies in Thailand, obviously global and, and as well as local brands. And we've actually been very surprised at the response. So, so the response from people is very, very high. The, the companies are very interested. But I think a lot of them, it's, this is still something new. They're not sure if Thai consumers will respond well. You know, we've had great success with in other countries, but in Thailand, this is something a little bit newer for them. So we're hoping that next year you'll start to see some of the first products um, coming out and programs coming out that are um, made from recycled material, potentially design redesigns based on that. But it's still a little bit too early for that. So, but again, that's not something that we alone can do. That's something that we're a piece in that bigger puzzle. Right. We need all these other organizations to help us with that. And you know, we're great at the certain things, but we, we definitely don't have the entire solution. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of insights there too. Um, and don't, um, don't mute yourself yet, James, because there's a question for you from the audience. Are there any organized efforts to bring informal workers and waste pickers into the alliances? So I think that question is definitely meant for you. <laughs> Um, uh, I think Alex meant it for, for a group as a whole, but um, for us, uh, they, when we're doing our hiring, so a big part of our expansion strategy is, is obviously um, creating stability for those informal workers. So now, while I think they wouldn't have much interest in, in joining most alliances because there's not those direct benefits for them, but I think uh, us working with other groups to help identify them so uh, this seems strange, but when we actually went out to hire people, it was difficult to find some of these informal waste pickers and ensure that we were hiring the most relevant people and, and creating the most impact with each hire. Um, and that's where, again, you know, if some of these other organizations would be able to join and help us highlight those people, it would certainly, for, for us, for example, help us make sure that we're, you know, we're you know, creating the most impact in those communities because we, we've been trying to make the communities part of the solution, not just sort of blaming them for all the waste that they're generating with going in there and, and, and not just doing educational programs, but actually hiring them to help us solve the problem. So uh, it's not quite getting them in the alliance, but it is um, making them part of the solution. And, and also the problem with a lot of the informals is they tend to collect the highest value. And my, my problem with that and a lot of the, you know, some of the volunteer group things, they collect 10 or 15% of the waste stream. Um, they recycle that and they claim success. Well, what about the other you know, 70, 80, 90% of the waste? Um, that needs to be dealt with as well. Um, so I think you know, if we can work with informals and work with other organizations, we can start to bring that part of the waste stream in and tackle it because it's, it's not easy. Right? Like anybody can recycle a PET bottle. I'm not really impressed by that. What do you do with the tons of other waste that we're seeing in the land and the canals? Um, and, uh, and the informal sector is very good at the high value items. You know, I visit a lot of facilities and they do a great job there, but they also need support to expand that to other things and you know, things like sachets and, and stuff like that. So that's where I think alliances can step in and, and try and encourage more recycling there, try and make it more sustainable financially for them to collect. We did see um, this um, uh, examples from um, Kunva Simon earlier about uh, what types of work have they been doing in the alliances to encourage more recycling. Um, and we've heard from Stephanie that she believes that reduction is still the key to, um, to eradicating plastic waste in nature. And now, and now James is actually um, talking about a lot more of the alliances that are funding the recovery of waste stream plastics so that it could be recycled and put back into circularity. Well, Megan has mentioned that there's quite a lot to look at in terms of the alliances that are in the same sector and they are actually basically competitors but also are sharing resources. My last question for, for all of the the panelists is that how would you want to see green alliances in the next few years to come um, given that this year zoomed by we had 
COVID-19 and COVID-19 and COVID-19, and that's pretty much it. Um, there's just a lot of um, attention and a lot of effort wasted on just rectifying the, the effects of COVID-19 on our businesses, on our daily operations, and also on our plastic consumption. So um, how would you see Green Alliance has become with this new norm now, okay? So people are very afraid of using, um, buying uncovered uh, food, for example. We talked about that in another session earlier. How do we get protection without plastics? So I'd like to ask all of you to give me like your thoughts on how would this look like now, now that everything has changed this year. Um, anyone can unmute yourself, please. I'll go ahead and start us off on, on this one, particularly since tourism has been one of the most heavily impacted uh, sectors from the, the pandemic. I would say that uh, one of the ways that I would hope Green Alliances will actually help us in the future is, is really embracing and facing on the fact that many businesses are and will be needing to deal with the impacts of, of uh, the economy, but also in many cases, closures to their businesses for nearly an entire fiscal year. And, uh, and that's going to cause a lot of really challenging decisions to be made up into the future. Um, and so there's concern about any uh, steps that could be taken, not only to revert back to business as normal, but actually take steps backwards by introducing more single use plastics as sort of behavioral change switches that might not ever switch back, right? This is something that we're very concerned about and have been working to build guidances on, on how we think we can even provide services that, uh, that don't use those options to, to begin with we had a whole medical advisory board that was actually giving us direct kind of uh, consultation on that capacity. But one I would say is, um, you know, really embracing that there's going to be a lot of micro decisions in every corner uh, that, that businesses are going to need to be making and they need to help. They need help to be able to navigate how sustainability can intersect with that. Because at the same time, businesses are also hearing that sustainability is what people are asking for. But that gap between needing to make decisions on how to survive and how to actually bring sustainability into play are going to be really important. So this is looking at things like efficiency, right? How can removing single-use plastics be better for the business model, better for the business bottom line? How can reducing food waste, which is a really easy one to start, right? How are there returns on that investment in a very short time scale because you're literally wasting resources. And so how can you think about these things that are good for the environment and also good for businesses to reduce waste as well? This is what we're also working for at Iberostar is transitioning to how do we get people to get a much better handle on that waste and and put a value on that so that we can reduce that as much as possible and see those sorts of returns so this is one that i would say kind of really embracing the fact that businesses are going to make really hard decisions about this and, and intersecting sustainability and efficiency as, a, as an important way to show the business case of why sustainability helps them to avoid the next crisis to come Thank you, Megan. I'm just uh, in the chat trying to post the link uh, to what you just mentioned about how um, hospitality industry can actually uh, still um, be be functional in terms of preventing COVID-19 spread, but also uh, reduce plastic consumption. That is something that your Green Alliance has actually done, and I, I'm a big fan. Um, any other um, panelists who, with your thoughts? Okay, so maybe I go. <laughs> So it's like, uh, couldn't agree more from, from what couldn't Megan say. It's like, uh, sometimes we have to trade off and then the, and the life threatening always come first. So, so that's why, so the, the plastic sometimes um, become a kind of a, a bad things, but actually is actually helping you. But I think the problem is we need to try to solve uh, the business model that can bring it back or can, can kind of uh, help us aware that, that this will help to save uh, in terms of our health, but then the, we need to treat them and, and take them to the right place. So, so that, that kind of thing, that, that's why we see some kind of a collect back model and, and some other uh, treatment that, that we need. So because I still believe that uh, there are many challenge on that and in order to, to handle or tackle such challenge, the connecting together like uh, within the, the hotel group or between industry and, and this kind of connection sometime uh, reach out to the government to know uh, kind of what kind of support 
that that we need so it's like uh, this a very challenge is you cannot do it alone so it's like uh, with some of support so it, and we can help uh, create a new system that that will will balance out this kind of uh, the need that that we have to handle uh, through the new norm right so from that and and i also believe that the everyone will want to see the collective effort like uh, how can we because the, the knowledge challenge platform that, that UNEP has tried to create is, is one of the good and very important step. But then afterward, the, the interaction between, uh, between these platform and, and how can it link to the, the policy adaptation or how can it link to, to the decision making of the industry. So it, it will come with the, the business model that will link also to the environmental impact. Like for example, like the climate change or the carbon tax will come to help and, and be part of the business model. Or when we're talking about the plastic collection with such costs. So you have to think about the, the intangible value that you have not count. And, and in, in the future, it has to be placed a value uh, in order to, to link to that. It's like you do it now, instead of you lose a lot in the future. So it's mean we have to have this kind of system as a collective so people can can start to do more, right? And especially the new generation, they want to they want to do good and they want to share and 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 a lot of our influencing to YouTube and to other things. I think we need to to link such kind of our influencing action and create the business out of that. So to to bring in to support this. So that, that's my idea. Yeah. Very well said, Kunva Simon. Wow, we, I hope that our note takers got that down. Um, we definitely need to have that those in quotes. Um, Stephanie and James, either one of you? Yeah, I could go next. Yeah, just a few, few quick thoughts. So very practically, we created a bring your own guide, especially for food outlets, how they can still accept bring your own, um, still um, under hygienic considerations, but still possible under COVID. So that's one message that we are definitely pulling out and other areas that we are obviously now focusing on industries that have now an even bigger footprint, like the food delivery and the e-commerce sector. So we are trying to work more closely with them to think about like circular solutions and um, reverse logistic and so on. So I think it also triggers a lot of thinking and people realizing the ways that they are creating when it comes to your home every day, you, you start to, to see it actually. So I think that's one, one important aspect. Um, on the other side, I also, just hope that COVID brought the awareness to a broader audience, to business audience, but also to the wider public of um, just the fact how much we depend on nature and how we are stretching or how we are already exceeding our planetary boundaries in many senses. And I, I think many people are realizing that COVID is just the first hit and that climate change will be even like a, a bigger problem or is already a bigger problem. So yeah, uh, just closing with my hope that it, it will actually trigger change and maybe even more radical change that would have been possible even before. Because we saw under COVID that governments and businesses can take very bold decision in a short term if they, if they have to. So that just, um, yeah, brings me to the hope that they can also act more boldly on, on the other pressing issues that we have. Speaking of acting boldly, can I, um, can I boldly ask the audience and also anyone who may actually um, um, have access to the recording of this to channel their thoughts about how WWF can mold green alliances to you so that you can pass on the message um, to some of the people who are leading green alliances within WWF. We know that WWF has a large network of that. And I myself uh, am uh, very fond of quite a lot of these green alliances that you each one of you represent. And so that's also um, a good chance to actually reset our, our goals and reset our um, our pathway to reach those goals because now that we have a new norm. And last but not least, let's definitely have James. Um, I don't really have anything to add, to be honest. I think that it said it quite well. So. Um, and I know we're sort of out of time, so I, I'd rather leave it for if anybody has any additional questions. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, we're very much on time. Um, just a final remark is that we do still, still have some of the plenary um, sessions later on with the high level um, um, diplomatic and also um, 
um, ministerial uh, guests. So please stay tuned for those. And um, thank you so much to our wonderful speakers for your insights and also for the transparency that you're willing to actually provide us with it today. Um, we know that many of you are um, very busy with the engagements, not wearing the hats that you're wearing today. Thank you so much for joining us from all the way from, from the United States, Megan. And um, I'll hand the time over to my technical uh, facilitator for a final uh, technical announcement. Thank you, Maggie and the panel. Thank you for attending the Sea of Solutions 2020 as well as today's session. These are the upcoming sessions. Please join them by clicking the link to the Hubilo community below, clicking program and selecting the session you'd like to join. Within the community, you can also explore the exhibitions as well as chat or set up meetings with other conference attendees. We're excited to invite you to contribute showcasing your voices for solutions to plastic pollution. We are seeking a simple but powerful pledge, a commitment or statement to less plastic wasted from the perspective of your work. Submit your pledge by going to the Hubilo community via the link in the chat and clicking pledges. Thank you once again for your participation and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Take good care, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.